Hello, and welcome to Spy Hard's podcast. I'm Agent Scott. And I'm Cam the Provocateur. And we are here talking about 1996's Brian De Palma, Mission Impossible, and we have a very special guest joining us. Yes, we are joined today by actress Ingeborga Dapkuneti, who played Hannah in Mission Impossible. Yes, one of the original IMF team before they're all unceremoniously killed at the start of the film. Uh, plenty to discuss with Ingeborga, stories of Mission Impossible, stories of Brian De Palma, John Malkovich, and much more. Cam, without further ado, light that fuse. And joining us now on the show, star of films like Seven Years in Tibet and this week's film, Mission Impossible, it is Miss Ingeborga Dapkuneti. Hello, Ingeborga, how are you? Hello, I'm very well, thank you. And uh, how are you? A pleasure. Oh, well, I'm wonderful. Better to have you here uh, by far. It's better than having Cam to talk to most of the time. So hey. it's, it's an improvement. <laughs> <laughs> yes, awesome to have you here. Very excited to talk about Mission Impossible. Thank you. Well, uh, before we get to all things Mission Impossible, I think the one question I love to ask at the start of these interviews is I want to get a feel of your story and what led you into to acting. So, you know, going back to, I don't know, childhood or your teenage years, what inspired you to want to become an actor in the first place? That's easy because my grandmother worked in the opera theater, in state theater of opera and drama of Lithuania. and. Um, uh, I was there from when I was born, probably, I think, well, uh, they took me there at the age where it was possible to carry, I think, kids into the theatre because she worked there. And sometimes there was no place for me to be because my mom worked as a meteorologist and she worked nights and dad worked. So, and uh, when I was four, um, a child who was playing Madame Butterfly's child in the opera got too old. So they looked around and they thought, oh, there isn't a boy who is four, but uh, my granny said, well, there is this girl who looks like a boy. She's my uh, granddaughter. And um, they got me. So I started playing the boy in Madame Butterfly. And that's how I started. And was there ever a point, because, you know, you're very young when you're playing that role, where you considered other careers or was it like you were kind of dead set right from almost that moment? No, I wasn't that set. Of course, you know, I played the play, and then there were different parts. I played, um, uh, I played a chicken, uh, and I played an insect, like a, what's it called? Uh, you know, the one that uh, you can see when it's lit. When it's dark, they, what, the firefly? Oh, mm -hmm. firefly, that's yeah. It, yeah. Yeah, that's what I played. And my dream was to play a monkey. And, uh, well, I did. Lots of uh, little parts in opera for kids. But then I went to school and, you know, peer pressure and all that. And I wanted to play basketball and I wanted to be an ice skater. And uh, then I kind of tried other things that kids try. Uh, but then when I think I was about 16, I went to the theater and I saw a show that I really kind of touched me and uh, my friends took me to a drama circle which is kind of like amateur theater for kids mm. for teenagers mm. and it turned out to be a very good one so um, and then I auditioned to conservatoire which had our in this it was the only um, kind of acting school which gives you a university education so and uh, I got through audition first time round and that was it. So it's interesting because, you know, you talk about being so inspired by the, you know, the opera and theater and that being a big part of the draw. Was there ever a consideration at that point in time towards TV and film or were you like solely focused on like theater and like live performing? Well, because I started in Lithuania, we always worked cross media there. So there was no, if you're in the theater, it's, you know, it's not a very big um, kind of we know each other there mm. so you you know you're bound to get to lots of places and and when you're sort of making those early steps into the world of acting tv and film stage work 
Was there any sort of inspirations, actors, actresses you look to, people to sort of model how you were performing upon? So inspirations for you, really? Inspirations? Huh. I really liked Peter too. Mm, right. Yes, I really liked him. Although the films that we got to see in Soviet Union were very limited. And uh, so uh, it wasn't Lawrence of Arabia at all. It was How to Steal a Million. With, oh, uh, that's a great movie. No, no. Yes, exactly. Yes. And um, if I'm not mistaken, it was Audrey Hepburn as well. Mm -hmm. So, yes. And, and of course, I fell in love with him. And I wanted, for some bizarre reason, I wanted to be like him. <laughs> not a bad person to emulate in terms of uh, on-screen performances. That's a definite shining star there. And, you know... I was lucky enough uh, because when we were doing a show in um, Old Vic, uh, which was called Cloaca, mm -hmm. he came and he was in the first row and I wow. got to see him alive, which was fantastic. I was just at the Old Vic a couple of weeks ago, actually. Wonderful place. Yes, it is. Um well, then, looking at your career, you, your credits on IMDb, at least, trail back to 84. Yeah. And there's a, there's a, I'm imagining you're doing a lot of work in sort of Lithuania, Soviet Union around that time. Uh, and is that where you're prim primarily working? Late 80s, early 90s. I didn't have um, other opportunities, but the Soviet Union, Lithuania, Russia, mm -hmm. uh, other con Armenia, I think. We did a, I did an Armenian film or something like that. Uh, early 90s, I, what happened to me in 1991, in December, I got an audition in London, which was unthinkable. And I flew in there mm -hmm. and I auditioned. And then uh, there was an actor. Uh, but this, it was a theater audition, which was also for us unthinkable because in, then in Soviet Union, you just joined the theatre company and the work there for, for life. And then you, when you are mm -hmm. retiring, you're retiring. That's it. But you, most of the time you spend in the same theatre company. So for us, auditioning was very bizarre. So uh, I went and auditioned. And uh, the actor um, was uh, fantastic. And then when he was saying goodbye to me, he said, that was terrific. And my English wasn't that good. Uh, uh, so I went out into the street and uh, it was Neil Street in London, in Covent Garden. Yeah. And it was Pineapple Studios, the, the rehearsal rooms were called. I came out and I met a guy, first guy I saw in the street. I said, can, can you answer any questions? Is terrific good or bad? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, oh, it was very good. And uh, so I got the job. And it was the show called Slip of the Tongue. And the actor was John Malkovich. That's how our, our friendship started. That was going to be my one of my questions later on, is how did that relationship start? So you've, uh, you've, you've answered already. That's a wonderful way. And, and also, uh, I love that bit of uh, sort of seven dials around Covent Garden in, in London there. It's a lovely lovely little area there yes it is mm -hmm. um well yeah. that was sort of leading me on so i was wondering how you made that transition into you know england and sort of more hollywood films which i'm guessing starts there then I, do you move over to london at that point i married the director <laughs> <laughs> right okay that works <laughs> yeah but we actually we opened in chicago and uh um Mm. And then we moved to London with the show. But the the other interesting thing about me moving and me getting the audition is the director producer called Dale Ibel Hoptaite, who actually somehow was already in London. And uh, the company that was auditioning for this uh, job for Slip of the Tongue knew her and the director knew her and he said could you get us somebody to audition from eastern europe and she said oh i know exactly the person and uh, 
uh, dialect basically changed my life. And um, maybe you know an actor and director called Dexter Fletcher. So yeah, yep. that is his wife. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is a very small uh, world. It, the world is very small. And uh, well, she, we've been friends uh, and all that. So that's how it went. Well, then that, that sort of cues up because then I imagine you, and I can see it on the credits, you start to do more work in England. Mm-hmm. When does the Hollywood work turn up? Because we've got Mission Impossible in 1996. That seems like the big feature film push. Where does that come about? Well, I, I think I, uh, my agent got an audition and uh, I met with Brian De Palma and he, I think he had one of my films on on a recorder when I came to see him. And basically he said, well, look, we had a chat. And he, he said, look, it's not a very big part and uh, you're going to be all right with it. So I think I was sitting there and he said, why are you sitting here? You got the job, go. <laughs> Were you familiar with like the work of Brian De Palma at that point at all? Or was it like you were? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. yes. By then, yes. Because it was already, I was, uh, it was 94, I think, or 95, 94. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yes, I was. So did that make it uh, feel even more high pressure when it is someone of such a pedigree or no? No. Because I don't know, I was young then, so. <laughs> and then it was actually the part wasn't, you know, that huge. Um, and also, you know, I had this theory that I had since, you know, I was just starting in England, I should go to every possible audition. So maybe out of 20, maybe I will get something. Mm. But you can't say the role is that small because we're going to spend the next twenty minutes talking about it. So we have to find, we have to find lots to talk about here. Um, but Cam, I think you had a question. Go. On. Well, I'm just curious when you're auditioning, like how are they kind of describing the character, or what is on the page for you to read? Well, there is something to read. I think there's always something to read. They, I don't. Well, look, it was thirty years ago, so it's very difficult for me to remember what That's fair. <laughs> there was to read. <laughs> but uh, I do remember Brian very well, Brian De Palma, mm-hmm. very well. I think it was some studio or something where I went. Well, let, let's 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 jump on the Brian De Palma of it all before maybe we get into it. Like, what was Brian like to work with? What was that experience like working with that director? Um, I only remember one bit. Uh, well, I remember lots, but one of them was I. Um, I had to do this little thing where I kind of go into the car. I think it's in the film. I have to get into the car, uh, look around, Mm -hmm. see if somebody is following me and get into the car. And we did one shot. That was okay. And then we did the next shot. And I thought, oh, oh my God, I didn't do it very well, but... It's a long shot. Maybe I, I got away with it and it's okay. But I knew it wasn't very good. And uh, I kind of raised my eyes and find Brian De Palma by the monitor. And he just did this. <laughs> <laughs> For those listening and just the audio, that was a shrug that, right there. That was a shrug. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a shrug and kind of his face went... You know what I mean. <laughs> when you watch his movies, they're so meticulous. And I'm just curious, as an actor working with yeah. him, is it very precise direction? Is there freedom still to kind of do your own thing? How does that kind of work? There is freedom, yes. And maybe if you are not in the, you know, close up, maybe if you are in the background, so there is more freedom. And we were doing. I don't know whether it is still in the scene. Uh, we were doing a scene where Christian Scott Thomas and we were told by him, and now you would try to do something with these lines on this uh, window. And I remember we were so silly with it. And he said, eventually, he said, 
this is the worst hanging of blinds I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Come and have a look. And we went and we thought, Jesus. No, but it was lo lots of fun, I have to say. And this marks, you know, Tom Cruise's first film as a producer. And, you know, did he play any significant role in terms of like when you're going through the casting process or like, did you have a sense of him as producer on the film? I did have a sense of him as a producer on the film because he was really caring. He was extremely nice. He would do something that not many people would like, for example, you know, you finish your, your, your filming day and I was standing there waiting for my car. And then his car is passing by and he stops and says, the window goes down and he says, are you okay? You've got your car. And I think, well, you don't need to worry about that. There are about a million people to do this. But he would stop and ask that, which was great. And no, we had lots of fun, lots. And uh, he was, we were so-called his team. Kristen Scott Thomas, Emmanuel Bear, John Voigt, Emilio Estevez. Did I forget anything? anybody else? I don't think so. We all, yeah, and uh, it was fantastic. It was absolutely, for me, it was joyous experience. And the only thing that we said to him, which wasn't nice, or, you know, we were kind of mm, about it. We said, well, look, Tom. You kill us all, <laughs> so we won't be able to be in, in the sequels. And he said, do you think there will be a sequel? And we all went, yes, there will be a sequel. <laughs> he had no idea what was coming. <laughs> Look at them yeah. now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yes. But yeah, it was uh, fantastic. What can I say? One of the one of the questions I thought would be interesting to ask is obviously you got when you got the role. So going back a little bit before you shoot, mm -hmm. did you mm -hmm. do any prep work for it at all? Did you go back and watch the TV show a little bit, or, or was it just I'm just going to act the scenes I have? Honestly, no. That's okay. <laughs> no, I think I think I you did just fine without it. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> for what I had to do, you know, so that when people want. To when my friends want to make a joke about me, they, they make a movement with glasses. And I go, what, 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 what is this joke? What about? And they go, Mission Impossible. I, I, uh, I saved a, an image from the film earlier. I'm going to make a, a little gif of it, of you just like zooming in and then you just touch your glasses up ever so slightly. <laughs> like a oh, massive no. shot just with a little tap of the glasses. I think it was great. It was a nice shot. <laughs> you know, the glasses, those days, 30 years ago, they were the miracle glasses. They literally go dark. And oh, light. those were a real thing? Yes, they were the real thing. Wow, I thought that was just an effect. They were the real thing. No, they were the real thing. We, we carried them as if they were, I don't know, made of diamonds, which probably that, they cost that much. And uh, Tom was very, very cool about it and very proud and all that. So we all played with that. Wow. And... Uh, no, they were real. They had a little button which you press and it went duck. I don't know how they did it. Well, one of my questions I think I had written down, I think actually Cam had this written yeah. down, was did you keep something as, as a prop? Obviously, you couldn't have kept the glasses by the sounds of it because they were being locked up in Fort <laughs> Knox. But did you, did you keep anything from your time on, on the shoot? There's one thing. On the day of the opening in London, mm. we didn't have mobile phones then. And... Uh, the phone rang and they said, uh, Tom would like to send you something. And this, are you going to be at home? And we said, yes. And uh, this box arrives. And in the box, there is an absolutely beautiful album with a photograph of me and him and lots of other stills from the film. and. Very nice letter from him. Thank you very much. And I uh, love Tom or whatever. And it was really beautiful. Hmm. And that I kept. It's nice. Yes, it was. And it is. Yeah. And you, you know, we're talking about the glasses, but I was just curious, you know, the, the gala scene itself, this like Im 
enormous set piece where you're there uh, undercover. Um, if you had any memories of just shooting that sequence, because it's so impressive just visually to watch. I was watching it last night. It was the first thing that was shot. Uh, when we arrived to Prague, it was shot in Prague in the museum. And uh, it was the very, very first scene that was shot, mm -hmm. both in the film and for me. And uh, I didn't know anybody arrived. And uh, um, obviously, I was nervous, like everybody else. We didn't quite know. What we were. And uh, Tom was being made up for his prosthetics. And I think he was being made up from like three o'clock in the morning. And uh, there were lots and lots of people. And I saw Kristen Scott Thomas, John Boyd. I didn't know Emilio as the best that well. And uh, we looked at each other with Kristen and she said, come here, <laughs> go. She goes, I know you. I go, I know you. Okay, let's sit together and be together for a bit now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was very, very nice because it, I honestly wanted somebody next to me in that whole big scene that I could talk to. And uh, she was fantastic. And I'm very, very happy I met her. And uh, we kept in touch. And it was very nice. That's really interesting because like the team has pretty good chemistry mm -hmm. when I watched the whole group of you together, like that really does work on screen. And so I was curious and you've kind of, I guess, answered the question of like, was there any, you know, in before shooting any time for the actors to spend together, just figuring out a dynamic, but obviously that was something that came more through shooting. Actually, Tom was very nice about it and he got us together. And we spent some time together mm. um, beyond filming. Right. You mentioned about finding Chris and Scott Thomas on the set on the first day of shooting. Having that friend there is is great, I imagine, because a bit of the pressure is taken off. But I mm -hmm. wanted to ask about pressure because looking at like the productions you've worked on, this feels like one of the bigger ones at that point in your career. Did you feel a bit of pressure going into that film? Because, it, it, I mean, Mission Impossible now is a pretty big thing. But in 1996... Was it as big a thing? It, I don't know. Well, it was the film with Tom Cruise and Brian De Palma. Mm -hmm. <laughs> how could it not be big? <laughs> and uh, how could it not be a, on, an, on any film? First shooting day is a bit of a challenge for me, for example. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you meet new people, you say hello, you kind of look for what, is, what the atmosphere is going to be like how people are going to behave and uh, you prepare as much as you can, if you can. And uh, yes, it was a huge thing. Regardless, that was it. Well, I wanted to ask about the briefing scene where it's the whole group of you together and John Boyd is giving instructions to everyone. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. that scene like really comes to life and there's Scott and I cover spy movies every week there's a lot of scenes of people in rooms that have no energy whatsoever we've encountered this many a times this one though really crackles on screen I was just curious was there like any improvisation going on um, was it all incredibly scripted out um, was there more to that scene that we didn't see if you had any memories of that I remember shooting it in studio Mm. Oh, I think we were we were just together. Mm. But I remember something out of that of those shooting days or day. I don't remember how many days we shot it. Tom said to us, "Kids, if you behave well, I will do something incredible because there is." Paul Newman shooting next door in the, in the stage next door. And uh, I will take you to meet him. Wow. Um, yes, and we were going... And I thought, oh my God, this is going to be embarrassing because 
uh, Paul Newman, together with his wife, came to see our show with John, where I was performing with John. And he came backstage and I met him. And uh, I was thinking, oh, what's going to happen now? He probably doesn't remember me. And uh, it will be very embarrassing to say, nice to meet you because I've already met you. And um, uh, hello, or, or not to say, well, uh, and I was kind of thinking, oh, do, 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 do. But then, you know, he, we didn't go. And then towards the end of the day, here he is with his blue eyes on our set saying, hello, hello. And Tom is introducing everybody. And uh, I say, hello, my name is Inga Vorga. He says, I know you. I came to see your show, John. Wow. And uh, yeah. And his eyes were as blue as they say they were. That is a, a moment to remember. That I had two of those moments. Uh, him coming to the theater and him coming to our stage. And that was what it was. I, I'm curious to know how many times Tom Cruise took it trying to pronounce your first name. That uh, Was it more or less the amount of times that I did off air before we started recording? But I'll, I'll, I'll save that question for another day. <laughs> All right, then. <laughs> I might as well set myself up for the joke. Um mm -hmm. But just like as a, as more like a holistic experience, looking back on shooting Mission Impossible, it, what is sort of your favorite scene you remember putting together? Your favorite moment from shooting the film it doesn't have to be a scene, but your favorite maybe moment from when you were doing it. When I was doing it, yeah, yeah, probably when we were all together. When we were all together, of course, because it was so much fun. Yes, everybody was, you know, very. They were kind of very nice together, all of us. And uh, but the, from the film is probably the moment when he's hanging. Of course, right? The big iconic oh, break sure. into the vault. Yeah. yeah. Mm, yes, that is the fantastic bit. And uh, I'm a fan, basically. You can see it. I'm not hiding very well. <laughs> not that I'm trying to. <laughs> Well, I'd love to know your thoughts on, you know, the whole gala sequence in particular. There's the experience of shooting it, but then actually seeing it all cut together and playing it on screen. Just your thoughts on that really memorable Brian De Palma sequence. Hmm. But you see, when I watch a film with myself, which I watched a while ago, actually during, I think, the opening in London, uh, which was a while ago. Um, that is bizarre because what I remember is not what I see, but I remember the reverse bit. So it's the museum, it's the street, it's our, you know, location uh, where all our trailers stand. It's a uh, makeup van. It's uh, makeup fun and we had so much fun with our makeup lisa tommy was the makeup uh person who was doing me up and now she's a, a makeup artist on films and i've just met her again and i have to say it's as if those 30 years didn't go by because <laughs> if people are fun they're fun mm -hmm. and she is a fantastic professional and a jolly good person as well. I suppose the last question I've got on Mission Impossible before we move on is mm -hmm. just maybe your thoughts on, on where it's gone since your film, since the Brian De Palma film. We've had six more and with another one on the way. Have you been keeping up with the series and sort of what are your thoughts on them? I love them. I've watched them, of course. I like them very much. It's great. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing the last one. Very much so. It's always an ongoing conversation in these films that uh, people who don't who die don't necessarily die. So I mean, there's, there's always room for old uh, Hannah Williams to pop up again. We never know. You might have escaped the car. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. No, it's it's a great, great 
And one of those where you can watch and Tom is just incredible, I have to say. What he does is amazing. Yes. Uh, he flies, he drives, he swims. I don't know what else he does. If you can think of it, he probably does it. Pardon? If you can think if of you it, think, he probably yes, it's true. Yeah. He's he's going to space soon to film a film. He's filming a film in space. What is that? Who does that? Tom Cruise. Yeah. We interrupt this program to bring you a special report. Calling all agents. Keeping the lights on at Spy Hard's HQ ain't cheap. And frankly, nor is feeding the school of attack piranhas. So we need your help. Roger that, Scott. Only at the Spy Hard's Patreon can you gain access to exclusive shows like Agents in the Field, which tackles non-spy films starring your favorite spy icons, and The Debrief where we channel our inner solitaires and predict how the big spy movie news of today will impact tomorrow. So make like a Treadstone agent and activate your Patreon membership at patreon.com slash spyhards today. Cam, tell the people what we have in our sights this week. Well, Scott, our frightful Halloween festivities continue as we are looking at 1991's The People Under the Stairs. What happens when you cross Wes Craven? with a couple of Twin Peaks icons. Venture into the crawl space with us and find out. But before this message self-destructs, Cam, resume the spy chinks. Well, I want to transition to another movie you did very shortly after, Seven Years in Tibet. And you have a very pivotal role in that movie. And I would just like to know, you're working with you know Brad Pitt, it's earlier in his career, just finding that dynamic of this kind of fraught marriage on screen with him. Well, we had a director, Jean-Jacques Arnaud, mm -hmm. who was, uh, uh, as you just said about Brian De Palma, the, his uh, attention to detail and his insight and his meticulousness uh, was, uh, that's what I think, what made it, mm. if there is something. Um, I was just curious if you had any memories of just working with Brad Pitt at that point, because that is kind of like right as he's sort of starting to explode as an actor. Oh, there were already about 300 people following him, mm -hmm. teenage girls screaming, uh, screaming. Uh, we were shooting in the square and they were just with and it was 40 degrees Celsius outside. We were shooting in Argentina. They were screaming like crazy we couldn't shoot so Jean-Jacques took uh, a ladder into the middle of the square he climbed the ladder and he said dear girls we understand you like Brad very much and that's why you're screaming but unfortunately we can't film because our sound quality is not good so can I make a deal with you I'll ask Brad now to come climb this ladder and wave to you, then you can scream for one minute as much as you want, as loud as you like, and then you let us work. <laughs> Do you agree? <laughs> <laughs> and then he said, okay, then I'm going to ask Brad to come and climb this and wave to you. And he climbed this because it was behind the wall, so you couldn't see what's happening in the square. So Brad came, climbed, the lad waved. They screamed like absolutely crazy, like you see in those documentaries about Beatles, about the Beatles and uh, or Elvis Presley. And they were screaming, screaming, screaming. And then he said, okay, fine. Thank you. And then they got quiet and we shot the scene. <laughs> I, I genuinely thought that was leading to them not shutting up and keeping yeah. screaming. So I'm glad they actually kept up their side of the deal. No, no, but it was quite amazing because the film crew, the film production company had to keep emergency services around us because they were fainting. So, and they're traveling with their parents as well. Mm -hmm. Were the parents fainting as well or just, just the kids? That I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> and how, how did you originally get involved with that film? I think Jean Jacques Arnaud saw a film called Burned by the Sun, mm -hmm. which at the time won a foreign film, 
Academy Award Oscar. And it was quite uh, kind of, so he saw that and he thought, oh, I'd like that. And then uh, that's it. And your character is very pivotal at the start and the end of the film. I was just curious your thoughts when you, if, you know, saw the finished film, because there's, uh, it's a very beautiful movie. For sure, I watched it just you know a week or so ago. Geez, the fantastic! And I was just curious, yeah, your thoughts on the overall movie when you finally saw it? I liked it very much. Yeah. But you see, you, you, through all this conversation, I'm kind of going, "This is great," but these are, you know, tiny parts. Mm -hmm. They're not really kind of, and you are being so respectful about it. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm laughing. It makes me laugh. I, I thought you were just laughing at Cam, which is which is That's fair common. Enough. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> mm. All right then. That as well. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, not uncommon. That's fair. That's fair. Mm -hmm. that's okay. But speaking of um, smaller roles, I, I did want to bring mm -hmm. one up um, because it's a spy movie, and we talk about spy movies here all the time. Mm -hmm. And a far more recent one too, which is 2018's Red Sparrow. Oh God, I haven't seen that film. <laughs> <laughs> you're in it though so i could ask about that at least um so you're in it as as the ballet director now if my memory serves you have a brief scene with jennifer lawrence if that's correct yes 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 do you recall filming that or sort of working with jennifer and what that was like oh she's great lovely yeah but i had half a day's shooting so what yeah. else can i say she was great and uh, there was a russian dancer called Babunin, he was also fantastic. Uh, you know, no big deal. But I mean, uh, you know, you do your job, you go away. That's it. But you do spy things. I did a Norwegian TV series, but you're only talking films, which is called Occupied. That's a spy thing. It's about no, uh, Norway being occupied by Russia. We did three seasons of that. Now you're trying to find it on the computer. Just looking at it yeah, now. I found it already. I, the reason I didn't see it is because on IMDb, it's actually got its, uh, I think, Swedish name of Occupert or Occupert. Occupert. Perhaps, but, right. Yes. Yeah. It is not Swedish. Uh, it's Norwegian. Norwegian. My and, apologies to the Norwegians. Oh, ah, it's okay. And uh, it's on Netflix. Oh, nice. Ah. It's, a, it's actually quite uh, interesting that in 2014, they wrote... A script about Russia occupying Norway, and that was uh, the author and of that was Yu Nesbo, the famous Norwegian writer. Hmm. Well, I'm just going to ask about the show. I mean, it, drawing a sort of a contrast between a big box office thing like a Mission Impossible film and then working on a spy TV show. Mm -hmm. um, what's uh, yeah? How was that sort of differences in working on TV spy stuff? Is it something you've something you enjoy more doing tv work than films it wasn't quite a spy thing it was a political thriller sure. and uh, and it's a long thing so three seasons is quite a lot mm. uh quite a lot of it takes quite a lot of your life and uh, the people were absolutely we started we did 10 episodes and then we did eight episodes and then six episodes that's how the seasons went and uh, uh it was in norwegian in russian and in english it's uh, probably more political than spy do you have a preference for um like spending time with a character like with a tv show versus like a movie or a play where it's more of a you know like a shorter burst like do you like that being there for that evolution of a character over time. I liked doing long, uh, and I like doing long, I've, I've had quite a few of those long series because you get to know the character if you're lucky, if you work hard enough, and if you have a little bit of talent. Mm -hmm. So you get to work on it and eventually, you actually know how they think, you know how they move, you know what they would behave in this or that situation. And it's certainly the combination of how they be behave 
is married to what their decisions are like. Mm-hmm. And that is a really wonderful thing. One of the questions I had, and actually this kind of ties into that about sort of seeing a character through and seeing a relationship through for a long amount of time, is your, and we teed this up earlier, but your sort of working relationship with John Malkovich, which has been going on mm-hmm. for quite a few many years. We've, we've now traced that back to you know, Neil Street in, in London, which I think is uh, in Pineapple Street. Mm-hmm. Lovely, place, yes. lovely place to start. Lovely place to start. What is it mm-hmm. about the, the sort of working relationship that sort of brings you to keep coming back to working together? Well, I think maybe certain things should not be explained because mm-hmm. it's something that happily to me, happen to me, there is. And uh, we both say the same thing. I haven't worked with anybody as many times and John hasn't worked with anybody as many times. And uh, uh, we're doing a show now called In the Solitude of Cotton Fields. Mm-hmm. It's a play by Bernard Maria Coltes, written uh, around 1984 and uh, was performed by... Uh, Patrick Chéreau, if you know what I mean. It's a great French director and actor. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're doing our version of it. Um, And director is a fantastic Russian director called Timofey Kulabin. He's extremely talented. And uh, we, we started working on Zoom during pandemic probably lots of projects that started like that and we were a bit looked what this and this and because it's a it's a play consisting of monologues Mm -hmm. and uh, then we kind of thought oh maybe this or that and then we bit by bit we started to love it and uh, then we said, uh, and then the director said, here is the set and showed it to us on Zoom. <laughs> and uh, here we realized that it's materializing. And eventually we rehearsed it live and opened it. And uh, then we to- now we are touring it. We've been to the Riga. That's where we opened it in Dialis Theater. Then we went to Athens to Onassis Center. They were co producers. Then to Sofia, Bulgaria. Then to Tallinn. Then to Vilnius, my town where I was born. Then to Naples. I probably forgot something. And uh, we will continue. Well, I was just looking at it, and, and based on when this uh, episode is coming out, I think you'll be in Armenia in a couple of weeks' time doing it there, and then following on with Georgia, I believe. Yes, yes, yes. And then we will be going probably to Germany and... The Netherlands, I think. Yes, yeah. Thalia Theatre, wonderful theatre in Hamburg, and in Amsterdam, the theatre that was for a long time, the artistic director of that theatre was Ivo van Hof probably know him if you know theater and um, yeah so that's very nice well i mean you say about like the relationship with with john the working relationship sometimes these things are just ethereal that you can't describe them per se you just they are that you have a strong bond with people so maybe that's just one of those things that that exists and it's clear that you've got a strong relationship because you've been working for so long together which i think is great um one question i wanted to sort of start to wrap us up with Aside from the films we've discussed, from big parts to small parts, is there a film that you've worked on that you're particularly proud of that people should, maybe didn't get the love it deserved, you think people should go and find? I would say Occupied is Mm. one of those, because it's easy to find us on Netflix. Sure. Uh, And also it coincides a little bit with, with what, well, a little bit, tiny bit with what's going on in the world now. Mm. Um, it's political Um, I will probably soon open a show 
uh, which I have done in Russia, but I uh, want to do it in London, probably and tour it. It's about my family. It's about um, it's about family, and it's saga, and uh, it's how the historical events affect the family and people in the family. And because Vilnius, my city, was always on the crossroads, it was part of Tsarist Russia, then uh, it became independent, then it became Polish, then it became this and that, and whoever wanted came in, went away, and finally we got our independence back in uh, 1991. Mm. Well, um, you have to keep uh, keep a surprise on that one because if it's opening in London, I live here, so I'll have to pop down and uh, hopefully mispronounce your name in person. <laughs> mm, I will invite you. Ah, I'd, I'd, I'd love to see it. So um, we'll, we'll keep tabs Thank on you. that and let us know. Um, the you. last question I have for you, and this is the question mm -hmm. that's been asked to literally everyone that's ever been on this show. And I think we've sent you this before, so you've had time to prepare. Oh, God. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> this might just surprise you come out of nowhere, but that's absolutely fine. All right, I'll be spontaneous. Okay, okay. Ingeborga, the question is, what is your favorite spy movie of all time? <laughs> that's easy. Mission Impossible. Ah, nah. I know you were going to do that. That's <laughs> cheating. No, it's not. It is uh, not. It's a good film to pick, to be fair. Like, I can't, I can't complain yes. with the choice. Exactly. It, could I push you for a second one? Second one? Um, second one after. All right. No, no, no. I, I, uh, I would do the present company included. Um, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I guess it would be the old, uh, an old one, some kind of old film, because, you know, like, uh, ah, it would be La Carre, probably, and uh, what was it, which one was, which one was with Ali Guinness? Oh, that's Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy and Smiley's People. Exactly. Yes, Smiley's People. That's the one. That's a good one. You've made a lot of people very happy with that choice, I think. Why? It's it's a very it's a beloved show, so I think a lot of people are very happy that you picked it. Okay. Do, do uh, if I pick it, do you show it? Oh, we, we haven't spoken about it yet on the show. To be fair, actually, we haven't spoken about either of those. We should do it at some point, but uh, no, it's it's beloved by spy fans. So I think you picked a beloved uh, film right there. Yeah, but that was a great spy writer. Hmm. True enough. And you were also part of a great spy film that we're celebrating this week. I can't thank you enough for taking the time to speak with us. We're starting the campaign now. Mission Impossible 8. We're going to get Hannah back. You're going to survive that car explosion somehow. <laughs> All right, Make man. it back in the film. We're starting the campaign <laughs> okay. here. Justice for Hannah. Hashtag it. <laughs> Hashtag it. <laughs> thank you very much. It was a joy. Thank you. All, all our pleasure. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. There you go. That was our chat with Inge Borga. I want to thank her once again for taking the time to speak to us all about Mission Impossible and much more. And if you like what you heard on that interview, we have over 50 Spymaster interviews in our back catalogue to check out. We've got a couple of Mission Impossible ones now alongside plenty of James Bond and much more. So make sure you hit that subscribe button. But Cam, what a chat. What did you think? This was very exciting for me, Scott. I am a huge Brian De Palma fan. And so I love that now that we are tackling Mission Impossible, we talked to Paul Hirsch as well, mm -hmm. the editor of the film. I'm getting insight into the Brian De Palma process because you and I, for some reason, I have no idea why it was not intentional, but we've talked to a lot of people who've worked with Tony Scott. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've gotten a real insight into the Tony Scott directorial process. Brian De Palma is one I'm just totally geeking out about. So hearing her talk about you know, his kind of meticulous approach to directing the vibe on set, and even that really fun audition story she told us. Just give me more insight. I'm loving this stuff. Is that the Brian De Process that you enjoyed? <laughs> yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks, thanks for uh, no-selling that one. That's good.
No, I, I think this was a, a very insightful chat. And it's it's interesting to hear from people who have worked alongside you know Tom Cruise in these mission films. And I think you know going forward, we'll be looking at the other mission films. But this is where it all started. And this is, you know, it's not a proven entity at this point. You know, entities are pun on Mission Impossible 7, of course. But, you know, they... They knew that they might have had something big here. As Ingeborg has said, you know, you've got Brian De Palma. Mission Impossible is a franchise from the 60s. Tom Cruise is a big name by this point. But it wasn't exactly like an instant box office. So it was nice to know that even on the set, they had an idea that this could have been special. Yeah, and it is notable, too, that in Dead Reckoning Part 1, there are several allusions back to this 1996 film. So it shows that, like... While the original Mission Impossible was like a big hit at the box office, ultimately, its influence has continued because you don't necessarily see the same level of reverence for, say, Mission Impossible 2 within the franchise. You don't see a lot of callbacks, whereas you see with this first movie, there are just endless callbacks throughout the ongoing future of the franchise. Don't you worry. When we get to Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 2, it's going to be all doves and all slow-mo. <laughs> you know what? At this point, sign me up. They can do no wrong. Well, based on the box office of part one, they could. Well, that's unfortunate. But um, I thought it was really interesting hearing her talk about Tom Cruise in mm -hmm. this film because this was his first major production with the launch of his production company with Paula Wagner. Mm -hmm. And just hearing her talk about the fact that he would like come and just check to make sure she was getting home okay. It's the sort of detail that like I find invaluable because there's this there's a real mystique around Tom Cruise. You and I have talked to multiple people about Tom Cruise, and I still feel like, who is this guy? Like I kind of don't have a great sense of it. And little stories like this help chip away kind of the impenetrable wall that this man has built around himself in terms of being this box office icon. Well, it's it's clear that whilst he has done things in his life that some people raise their eyebrow at. Mm -hmm. He does seem to take care of his own. You know, every story I've heard of him, it it's about him really caring about the process of filmmaking and really caring about his co-stars. And I don't think you can ask much more when it comes to a producer. And it's also a case of, in, at least in terms of his professional life and working with, you know, actors and all the various filmmakers that he would be dealing with, it is a very, like, lead by example approach mm. of like he commits everything and the people around him raise up their own game because of course they're going to when they see that the number one guy on the call sheet is giving his all yeah absolutely and, you know there's there's certain perks to having tom cruise as number one on the call sheet you know because he can just pop next door and get paul newman to come by and say hello <laughs> do you think he told any macintosh man stories when he came to visit uh, well, I don't think he told any stories, but he actually entered the room by diving <laughs> through the door. I thought this was a delightful little story. Um, Paul Newman, we'll, we will never really have that much access to Paul Newman's stories. No. Uh, and we have covered him now twice with uh, Torn Curtain and the Macintosh Man. So to get these little little insightful stories i just really enjoy and the fact that you know paul newman remembered seeing her in a play as well mm -hmm. uh you know around the same time period just a delightful little insight there it's also nice to know that you know paul newman was firing in all cylinders in 1995 because i can't even remember what i had for lunch <laughs> no kidding no kidding yeah i'm in the same boat the other bit i was sort of mildly blown away by was the glasses i I actually assumed, because of course now we have very vocals, like people can do that sort of, I think they're called very vocals or something, where you walk outside, transition lenses, I think we call them here, where you walk outside and when the sunlight hits them, they turn to sunglasses. But in 1996, I, I, I guess that was a sort of new invention. But what I found, I just thought this was an effect they did for the film. But that's actually, there was a button on the side, she pressed it and lo and behold, swoosh. I wonder if we would have thought that in 1996. We live in such a world now where everything is CG, mm -hmm. everything is faked, that we flock to, say, like Christopher Nolan movies because we're like, oh my God, someone's doing it for real. And I wonder if in 1996 we would have made that assumption or if we would have assumed that it was actually a real prop. Well, it just says to me that like anything goes. Mm -hmm. Because you know that Mission Impossible ends with a fantastic sequence on a train I've always assumed that was CG. Maybe it was entirely real. 
Um, there's a fair amount of CG going on there, <laughs> but it's also the early days of CG. Shut up, Cam. You went there. You went there. <laughs> Those are the early days of CG where, you know, it's that kind of post Jurassic Park boom where they're still using it somewhat um, conservatively. Mm. Where, you know, obviously with like a big set piece, yes, they're going to do it. But a lot of Mission Impossible, what makes it so refreshing is they do it for real. And that is obviously continuing into the modern day of that franchise and what makes it so exciting. It's interesting now. I wonder if uh, this is probably a conversation I don't think anyone's ever mentioned to me. But if if Tom Cruise could go back now as the you know, mega stuntman Buster Keaton wannabe that he is now, in the nicest way, that's not me being detrimental to him. Many people would love to be Buster Keaton. Would he have done that scene differently? I'm trying to think of like because yes, a lot of what they try to do now is real stunts and real mm. setups. This is a case where you're dragging a helicopter behind a high-speed train through the channel. I don't... Channel? Wasn't it the channel? Why do you keep calling it a channel? Well, that's... Isn't that the channel? We don't call it that. That's what we call it. Hold up. It's the, it's the channel tunnel. We don't call it the channel. The channel, yeah. What? Also known as the channel. I have never once... I don't do that thing where you Google me. I hate when you try and outfact me. I live in England. <laughs> no one's ever called it the channel. I think in North America, maybe not anymore, but it was called the channel over here because do you remember there's that Seinfeld episode where they go to the movies and the movie is called channel and there's like endless sound clips of we need to get to the channel. We need to get to the channel. We're journeying through the channel and you can hear it in the episode. I don't remember that. I believe you. Yeah. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna Google you like you Googled me. But <laughs> I've never once heard channel. I'm sorry, listeners. If you are, are, are all channel uh, knowers, believers, uh, hashtag channel. Let me know. I've never heard of the channel, and I've been on the channel tunnel. <laughs> okay. Well, either way, um, like I'm trying to think of like how you would even stage that in a practical manner. I guess you could have a train pulling, obviously, a helicopter. But it's not going to look the same. Like it, it would be like that would be pretty rigid looking. Like I think you need CG to pull off what they are trying to do in that sequence. Also, I don't think you'd get anyone that would fly a helicopter into a tunnel. Well, it wouldn't be flying. It would be attached to the train On rails or something like that. Yeah. 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 Mm. Interesting. An interesting uh, thought experiment. Maybe we could do one day. But I wonder if like the early mission films would be improved with tom cruise's dedication to stunts that he has now yes i it would be interesting to go back and have tom cruise remake his old films <laughs> using his uh current daring do <laughs> what's like what's like another cg thing that he's done in his past well didn't night and day have a fair number of cg sequences he did a lot of like the motorcycle riding but it did have some cg yeah, yeah he did that is true that is true and that's quite recent compared to 96. I don't feel like he really fell too heavily into the CG like craze. No, I, yeah. I, I think he was always kind of against it. I always got that impression. But like, you, I think, yeah, bringing us back on the rails, if you want to keep the uh, channel pun going. <laughs> uh, I don't I don't think you could do it any other way. So I think what they did was, was good. I think the only, only difference it would make to it now if they like remade it for some reason. Is it would just be better looking CG? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Or uh, worse. Who or knows worse. these days? <laughs> yeah. Just look at the gray man. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, but any other highlights from you, Cam? It was interesting just to hear her talk about the experience of um, seven years in Tibet and just the craze around Brad Pitt at that point in time. The whole story about all the girls screaming mm -hmm. and having to settle them down to shoot that section of the movie. I thought that was a lot of fun. And a kind of fun insight into where Brad Pitt was at that point. It's kind of that like post seven Legends of the Fall period where he's like the heartthrob. But I feel like he's not quite fully in that like respected actor model yet. No, I, I think you're right around about that time. A couple of years later, early noughties, I think he sort of hits that stride. I I can say I've never felt closer to Brad Pitt knowing that he had to fight so many potential partners off i mean i live that life i walk mm. down the street and i am overburdened with propositions yeah uh no i'm kidding i've never once experienced that and uh i am envious that uh, brad had ever dealt with anything like that 
I wonder how awkward it was for him in that time period. Like, if it happens now, he's like, yeah, 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 whatever. But yeah. in, like, 1997, when you're kind of, like, trying to portray yourself as something of a serious actor, he was taking a lot of roles around that point where he would, like, kind of distort his looks or something. I think of 12 Monkeys as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, Fight Club's a couple years later. And I, I wonder, like how much of kind of like an annoyance it was to him or if he just thought it was fun i'd have no idea we'll have to talk to brad pitt to find out yeah next week on the show uh braddy boy stopping by who knows scott you never know we can only hope absolutely the chair is always open we just hope people take a seat but uh, that about wraps us up for our coverage of the first mission impossible film I hope it's been worth the wait for you all three years. We've finally gotten around to our first mission film. On to many more, I hope. But Cam, the question goes to you, sir. What are we following up with next week? Scott, people have been begging us for Mission Impossible for a long time. That is kind of like one of those all in lights titles that you have to do at some point on a spy podcast. Mm -hmm. Another movie... Maybe a little bit lower in reputation, maybe not as widely acknowledged, but one we have been peppered with constantly on social media, we're finally going to tackle it. We are going to look at the 1975 Clint Eastwood espionage thriller, The Iger Sanction. Yes, yes, yes. Stick on your snow boots. We're going to go climb a mountain with Clint. I'm looking forward to it. So your mission, folks, should you choose to accept it, is to join us next week as we tackle 1975's The Iger Sanction. And if you like what you heard on this episode, please consider leaving us a five-star review wherever you're listening. And don't forget to follow us discreetly, of course, on social media at SpyHards. That's S-P-Y-H-A-R-D-S on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. But until next week, listeners, you'll find me riding the channel.